Chapter Seven: The Mother's Struggle. It is impossible to conceive of a human creature more wholly desolate and forlorn than Eliza when she turned her footsteps from Uncle Tom's cabin. Her husband's suffering and dangers, and the danger of her child, all blended in her mind with a confused and stunning sense of the risk she was running in leaving the only home she had ever known and cutting loose from the protection of a friend whom she had loved and revered then there was the parting from every familiar object the place where she had grown up the trees under which she had played the groves where she had walked many an evening in happier days by the side of her young husband everything as it lay in the clear frosty starlight seemed to speak reproachfully to her and ask her whither could she go from a home like that but stronger than all was maternal love wrought into a paroxysm of frenzy by the near approach of a fearful danger her boy was old enough to have walked by her side and in an indifferent case she would only have led him by the hand but now the bare thought of putting him out of her arms made her shudder and she strained him to her bosom with a convulsive grasp as she went rapidly forward the frosty ground creaked beneath her feet and she trembled at the sound every quaking leaf and fluttering shadow sent the blood backward to her heart and quickened her footsteps she wondered within herself at the strength that seemed to be come upon her for she felt the weight of her boy as if it had been a feather and every flutter of fear seemed to increase the supernatural power that bore her on while from her pale lips burst forth in frequent ejaculations the prayer to a friend above lord help lord save me if it were your harry mother or your willie that were going to be torn from you by a brutal traitor to-morrow morning if you had seen the man and heard that the papers were signed and delivered and you had only from twelve o'clock till morning to make good your escape how fast could you walk how many miles could you make in those few brief hours with the darling at your bosom the little sleepy head on your shoulder the small soft arms trustingly holding on to your neck for the child slept at first the novelty and alarm kept him waking but his mother so hurriedly repressed every breath or sound and so assured him that if he were only still she would certainly save him that he clung quietly round her neck only asking as he found himself sinking to sleep mother i don't need to keep awake do i no my darling sleep if you want to but mother if i do get asleep you won't let him get me no so may god help me said his mother with a paler cheek and a brighter light in her large dark eyes you're sure ain't you mother yes sure said the mother in a voice that startled herself for it seemed to her to come from a spirit within that was no part of her and the boy dropped his little weary head on her shoulder and was soon asleep how the touch of those warm arms the gentle breathings that came in her neck seemed to add fire and spirit to her movements it seemed to her as if strength poured into her in electric streams from every gentle touch and movement of the sleeping confiding child sublime is the dominion of the mind over the body that for a time can make flesh and nerve impregnable and string the sinews like steel so that the weak become so mighty the boundaries of the farm the grove the woodlot passed by her dizzily as she walked on and still she went leaving one familiar object after another slacking not pausing not till reddening daylight found her many a long mile from all traces of any familiar objects upon the open highway she had often been with her mistress to visit some connections in the little village of t not far from the ohio river and knew the road well to go thither to escape across the ohio river were the first hurried outlines of her plan of escape beyond that she could only hope in god when horses and vehicles began to move along the highway with that alert perception peculiar to a state of excitement and which seems to be a sort of inspiration she became aware that her headlong pace and distracted air 
might bring on her remark and suspicion she therefore put the boy on the ground and adjusting her dress and bonnet she walked on at as rapid a pace as she thought consistent with the preservation of appearances in her little bundle she had provided a store of cakes and apples which she used as expedients for quickening the speed of the child rolling the apple some yards before them when the boy would run with all his might after it and this ruse often repeated carried them over many a half mile after a while they came to a thick patch of woodland through which murmured a clear brook as the child complained of hunger and thirst she climbed over the fence with him and sitting down behind a large rock which concealed them from the road she gave him a breakfast out of her little package the boy wondered and grieved that she could not eat and when putting his arms round her neck he tried to wedge some of his cake into her mouth it seemed to her that the rising in her throat would choke her no no harry darling mother can't eat until you are safe we must go on on till we come to the river and she hurried again into the road and again constrained herself to walk regularly and composedly forward she was many miles past any neighbourhood where she was personally known if she should chance to meet any who knew her she reflected that the well-known kindness of the family would be of itself a blind to suspicion as making it an unlikely supposition that she could be a fugitive as she was also so white as not to be known as of coloured lineage without a critical survey and her child was white also it was much easier for her to pass on unsuspected on this presumption she stopped at noon at a neat farmhouse to rest herself and buy some dinner for her child and self for as the danger decreased with the distance the supernatural tension of the nervous system lessened and she found herself both weary and hungry the good woman kindly and gossiping seemed rather pleased than otherwise with having somebody come in to talk with and accepted without examination eliza's statement that she was going on a little piece to spend a week with her friends all which she hoped in her heart might prove strictly true an hour before sunset she entered the village of t by the ohio river weary and footsore but still strong in heart her first glance was at the river which lay like jordan between her and the canaan of liberty on the other side it was now early spring and the river was swollen and turbulent great cakes of floating ice were swinging heavily to and fro in the turbid waters owing to the peculiar form of the shore on the kentucky side the land bending far out into the water the ice had been lodged and detained in great quantities and the narrow channel which swept round the bend was full of ice piled one cake over another thus forming a temporary barrier to the descending ice which lodged and formed a great undulating raft filling up the whole river and extending almost to the kentucky shore eliza stood for a moment contemplating this unfavourable aspect of things which she saw at once must prevent the usual ferry-boat from running and then turned into a small public-house on the bank to make a few inquiries the hostess who was busy in various fizzing and stewing operations over the fire preparatory to the evening meal stopped with a fork in her hand as eliza's sweet and plaintive voice arrested her what is it she said isn't there any ferry or boat that takes people over to b now she said no indeed said the woman the boats has stopped running eliza's look of dismay and disappointment struck the woman and she said inquiringly maybe you're wanting to get over anybody sick ye seem mighty anxious i've got a child that's very dangerous said eliza i never heard of it till last night and i've walked quite a piece to-day in hopes to get to the ferry well now that's unlucky said the woman whose motherly sympathies were much aroused i'm really concerned for ye solomon she called from the window towards a small back building a man in leathern apron and very dirty hands appeared at the door i say so said the woman 
is that air man going to tote them barrels over to-night he said he would try if twas any way prudent said the man there's a man a piece down here that's going over with some truck this evening if he durs to he'll be in here to supper to-night so you'd better set down and wait that's a sweet little fellow added the woman offering him a cake but the child wholly exhausted cried with weariness poor fellow he isn't used to walking and i've hurried him on so said eliza well take him into this room said the woman opening into a small bedroom where stood a comfortable bed eliza laid the weary boy upon it and held his hands in hers till he was fast asleep for her there was no rest as a fire in her bones the thought of the pursuers urged her on and she gazed with longing eyes on the sullen surging waters that lay between her and liberty here we must take our leave of her for the present to follow the course of her pursuers though mrs shelby had promised that the dinner should be hurried on table yet it was soon seen as the thing has often been seen before that it required more than one to make a bargain so although the order was fairly given out in haley's hearing and carried to aunt chloe by at least half a dozen juvenile messengers that dignitary only gave certain very gruff snorts and tosses of her head and went on with every operation in an unusually leisurely and circumstantial manner for some singular reason an impression seemed to reign among the servants generally that mrs would not be particularly disobliged by delay and it was wonderful what a number of counter accidents occurred constantly to retard the course of things one luckless white contrived to upset the gravy and then gravy had to be got up de novo with due care and formality aunt chloe watching and stirring with dogged precision answering shortly to all suggestions of haste that she warn't a going to have raw gravy on the table to help nobody's catchings one tumbled down with the water and had to go to the spring for more and another precipitated the butter into the path of events and there was time to time giggling news brought into the kitchen that master haley was mighty uneasy and that he couldn't sit in his cheers no way but was a walkin and a stalkin to the windows and through the porch sarves him right said aunt chloe indignantly he'll get worse nor uneasy one of these days if he don't mend his ways his master'll be sending for him and then see how he'll look he'll go to torment and no mistake said little jake he desarves it said aunt chloe grimly he's broke a many 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 hearts i tell ye all she said stopping with a fork uplifted in her hands it's like when massa george reads in revelations souls a callin under the altar and a callin on the lord for vengeance on sich and by and by the lord he'll hear em so he will aunt chloe who was much revered in the kitchen was listened to with open mouth and the dinner being now fairly sent in the whole kitchen was at leisure to gossip with her and to listen to her remarks sitch will be burned up for ever and no mistake said andy i'd be glad to see it i'll be bound said little jake chillin said a voice that made them all start it was uncle tom who had come in and stood listening to the conversation at the door chillin he said i'm afeard you don't know what you're sayin for ever is a dreadful word chillin it's awful to think on't you oughtn't to wish that are to any human critter we wouldn't to anybody but the soul drivers said andy nobody can help wishing it to them they's so awful wicked don't nature herself kind of cry out on em said aunt chloe don't they tear their sucking baby right off his mother's breast and sell him and her little children as is crying and holding on by her clothes don't they pull em off and sells em don't they tear wife and husband apart said aunt chloe beginning to cry when it's just taken the very life on em and all the while does they feel one bit 
don't they drink and smoke and take on uncommon easy lor if the devil don't get him what's he good for and aunt chloe covered her face with her checked apron and began to sob in good earnest pray for them that spitefully use you the good book says says tom pray for em said aunt chloe lor it's too tough i can't pray for em it's nature chloe and nature's strong said tom but the lord's grace is stronger besides you oughter think what an awful state a poor critter's soul is in that'll do them our things you oughter thank god that you ain't like him chloe i'm sure i'd rather be sold ten thousand times over than to have all that our poor critter's got to answer for so'd i a heap said jake lor shouldn't we cotch it andy andy shrugged his shoulders and gave an accusant whistle i'm glad master didn't go off this morning as he looked to said tom that ar hurt me more than sellin it did maybe it might have been natural for him but it would have come desperate hard on me as has known him from a baby but i've seen master and i begin to feel sort of reconciled to the lord's will now master couldn't help hisself he did right but i'm feared things will be kinder goin to rack when i'm gone master can't be expected to be a pryin round every war as i've done a keepin up all the ends the boys all means well but they's powerful careless that air troubles me the bell here rang and tom was summoned to the piler tom said his master kindly i want you to notice that i give this gentleman bonds to forfeit a thousand dollars if you are not on the spot when he wants you he's going to-day to look after his other business and you can have the day to yourself go anywhere you like boy thank you masser said tom and mind yourself said the trader and don't come it over your master with any of your nigger tricks for i'll take every cent out of him if you ain't there if he'd hear to me he wouldn't trust any on ye slippery as eels masser said tom and he stood very straight i was just eight years old when old missus put you into my arms and you wasn't a year old thar says she tom that's to be your young masser take good care on him says she and now i just ask you masser have i ever broke a word to you or gone contrary to you specially since i was a christian mr shelby was fairly overcome and the tears rose to his eyes my good boy said he the lord knows you say but the truth and if i was able to help it all the world shouldn't buy you and as sure as i am a christian woman said mrs shelby you shall be redeemed as soon as i can any bring together means sir she said to haley take good account of who you sell him to and let me know lor yes for that matter said the trader i may bring him up in a year not much the worse for wear and trade him back i'll trade with you then and make it for your advantage said mrs shelby of course said the trader all's equal with me lives trade em up as down so i does a good business all i want is a livin you know ma'am that's all any on us wants i s'pose mr and mrs shelby both felt annoyed and degraded by the familiar impudence of the trader and yet both saw the absolute necessity of putting a constraint on their feelings the more hopelessly sordid and insensible he appeared the greater became mrs shelby's dread of his succeeding in recapturing eliza and her child and of course the greater her motive for detaining him by every female artifice she therefore graciously smiled assented chatted familiarly and did all she could to make time pass imperceptibly at two o'clock sam and andy brought the horses up to the posts apparently greatly refreshed and invigorated by the scamper of the morning sam was there new oiled from dinner with an abundance of zealous and ready officiousness as haley appeared he was boasting in flourishing style to andy of the evident and eminent success of the operation now that he had fairly come to it 
"'Your master, I suppose, don't keep no dogs?' said Haley, thoughtfully, as he prepared to mount. "'Heaps on em, said Sam, triumphantly. "'Thar's Bruno. He's a roarer. And besides that, about every nigger of us keeps a pup of some nature or other.' "'Pa,' said Haley, and he said something else, too, with regard to the said dogs, at which Sam muttered, "'I don't see no use cussin' on em. No way.' but your master don't keep no dogs i pretty much know he don't for trackin out niggers sam knew exactly what he meant but he kept on a look of earnest and desperate simplicity our dogs all smells round considerable sharp i spec they's the kind though they han't never had no practice they's far dogs though at most anything if you'd get em started here bruno he called, whistling to the lumbering Newfoundland, who came pitching tumultuously toward them. "'You go hang,' said Haley, getting up. "'Come, tumble up now.' Sam tumbled up accordingly, dexterously contriving to tickle Andy as he did so, which occasioned Andy to split out into a laugh, greatly to Haley's indignation, who made a cut at him with his riding-whip. "'I astonished at your Andy,' said Sam, with awful gravity. This year's a serious business, Andy. You mustn't be a makin' game. This year ain't no way to help Massa. I shall take the straight road to the river, said Haley decidedly, after they had come to the boundaries of the estate. I know the way of all of em. They makes tracks for the underground. Sartin, said Sam. Dat's de idee. Massa Haley hits de thing right in de middle. Now, there's two roads to de river, de dirt road and der pike. Which master means to take? Andy looked up innocently at Sam, surprised at hearing this new geographical fact, but instantly confirmed what he said by a vehement reiteration. Cos, said Sam, I'd rather be inclined to imagine that Lizzie'd take de dirt road, being it's the least travelled. Haley notwithstanding that he was a very old bird and naturally inclined to be suspicious of chaff was rather brought up by this view of the case if you warn't both on your such cussed liars now he said contemplatively as he pondered a moment the pensive reflective tone in which this was spoken appeared to amuse andy prodigiously and he drew a little behind and shook so as apparently to run a great risk of falling off his horse while sam's face was immovably composed into the most doleful gravity course said sam master can do as he'd rather go de straight road if master think best it's all one to us when i study pon it i think de straight road de best decidedly she would naturally go a lonesome way said Haley, thinking aloud, and not minding Sam's remark. "'Dar ain't no sayin,' said Sam. "'Gals is peculiar. They never does nothin' you think say well, most generally the contrary. Gals is natly made contrary, so if you think they've gone one road, it is sartin you'd better go t'other, and then you'll be sure to find em. Now, my private opinion is, Lizzie took de road, so I think we'd better take de straight one. This profound generic view of the female sex did not seem to dispose Haley particularly to the straight road, and he announced decidedly that he should go the other, and asked Sam when they should come to it. A little piece ahead, said Sam, giving a wink to Andy with the eye that was on Andy's side of the head, and he added gravely, but i've studied on de matter and i'm quite clar we ought not to go dat air way i never been over it no way it's despot lonesome and we might lose our way where we come to de lord only knows nevertheless said haley i shall go that way now i think on it i think i hearn em tell that dat our road was all fenced up and down by de creek and thar and to Andy? Andy wasn't certain. He'd only hear and tell about that road, but never been over it. In short, he was strictly non-committal. Haley, accustomed to strike the balance of probabilities between lies of greater or lesser magnitude, 
thought that it lay in favour of the dirt road aforesaid the mention of the thing he thought he perceived was involuntary on sam's part at first and his confused attempts to dissuade him he set down to a desperate lying on second thoughts as being unwilling to implicate liza when therefore sam indicated the road haley plunged briskly into it followed by sam and andy now the road in fact was an old one that had formerly been a thoroughfare to the river but abandoned for many years after the laying of the new pike it was open for about an hour's ride and after that it was cut across by various farms and fences sam knew this fact perfectly well indeed the road had been so long closed up that andy had never heard of it he therefore rode along with an air of dutiful submission only groaning and vociferating occasionally that twas desperate rough and bad for jerry's foot now i just give yer warning said haley i know yer yer won't get me to turn off this road with all yer fussin so you shet up master will go his own way said sam with rueful submission at the same time winking most portentously to andy whose delight was now very near the explosive point sam was in wonderful spirits professed to keep a very brisk lookout at one time exclaiming that he saw a gal's bonnet on the top of some distant eminence or calling to andy if that there wasn't lizzie down in the hollow always making these exclamations in some rough or craggy part of the road where the sudden quickening of speed was a special inconvenience to all parties concerned and thus keeping haley in a state of constant commotion after riding about an hour in this way the whole party made a precipitate and tumultuous descent into a barnyard belonging to a large farming establishment not a soul was in sight all the hands being employed in the fields but as the barn stood conspicuously and plainly square across the road it was evident that their journey in that direction had reached a decided finale want dat air what i telled masser said sam with an air of injured innocence how does strange gentlemen spec to know more about a country dan de natives born and raised you rascal said haley you knew all about this didn't i tell yer i knowed and yer wouldn't believe me i tell masser twas all shet up and fenced up and i didn't spec we could get through and he heard me it was all too true to be disputed and the unlucky man had to pocket his wrath with the best grace he was able and all three faced to the right about and took up their line of march for the highway in consequence of all the various delays it was about three-quarters of an hour after eliza had laid her child to sleep in the village tavern that the party came riding into the same place eliza was standing by the window looking out in another direction when sam's quick eye caught a glimpse of her haley and andy were two yards behind at this crisis sam contrived to have his hat blown off and uttered a loud and characteristic ejaculation which startled her at once she drew suddenly back and the whole train swept by the window round to the front door a thousand lives seemed to be concentrated in that one moment to eliza her room opened by a side door to the river she caught her child and sprang down the steps toward it the trader caught a full glimpse of her just as she was disappearing down the bank and throwing himself from his horse and calling loudly on sam and andy he was after her like a hound after a deer in that dizzy moment her feet to her scarce seemed to touch the ground and a moment brought her to the water's edge right on behind they came and nerved with strength such as god gives only to the desperate with one wild cry and flying leap she vaulted sheer over the turbid current by the shore on to the raft of ice beyond it was a desperate leap impossible to anything but madness and despair and haley sam and andy instinctively cried out and lifted up their hands as she did it the huge green fragment of ice on which she alighted pitched and creaked as her weight came on it but she stayed there not a moment 
with wild cries and desperate energy she leaped to another and still another cake stumbling leaping slipping springing upwards again her shoes are gone her stockings cut from her feet while blood marked every step but she saw nothing felt nothing till dimly as in a dream she saw the ohio side and a man helping her up the bank ye're a brave gal now whoever ye are said the man with an oath eliza recognized the voice and face for a man who owned a farm not far from her old home oh mr sims save me do save me do hide me said eliza why what's this said the man why if tain't shelby's gal my child this boy he sold him there is his master said she pointing to the kentucky shore oh mr sims you've got a little boy so i have said the man as he roughly but kindly drew her up the steep bank besides you're a right brave gal i like grit wherever i see it when they had gained the top of the bank the man paused i'd be glad to do something for ye said he but then there's nowhere i could take ye the best i can do is tell ye to go thar said he pointing to a large white house which stood by itself off the main street of the village go thar they're kind folks thar's no kind of danger but they'll help you they're up to all that sort of thing the lord bless you said eliza earnestly no occasion no occasion in the world said the man what i've done's of no account and oh surely sir you won't tell any one go to thunder gal what do you take a feller for in course not said the man come now go along like a likely sensible gal as you are you've aren't your liberty and you shall have it for all me the woman folded her child to her bosom and walked firmly and swiftly away the man stood and looked after her shelby now maybe won't think this year the most neighbourly thing in the world but what's a feller to do if he catches one of my gals in the same fix he's welcome to pay back somehow i never could see no kind of critter a striving and pantin and trying to clare theirselves with the dogs arter em and go agin em besides i don't see no kind of occasion for me to be hunter and catcher for other folks neither so spoke this poor heathenish kentuckian who had not been instructed in his constitutional relations and consequently was betrayed into acting in a sort of christianized manner which if he had been better situated and more enlightened he would not have been left to do haley had stood a perfectly amazed spectator of the scene till eliza had disappeared up the bank when he turned a blank inquiring look on sam and andy that ar was a tolerable fair stroke of business said sam that gal's got seven devils in her i believe said haley how like a wild cat she jumped well no said sam scratching his head i hope master scoos is trying dat ar road don't think i feel spry enough for dat ar no way and sam gave a hoarse chuckle you laugh said the trader with a growl lord bless you master i couldn't help it now said sam giving way to the long pent-up delight of his soul she looks so curious a leapin and springin ice a crackin and only to hear her plump her chunk her splash spring lord how she goes it and sam and andy laughed till the tears rolled down their cheeks i'll make ye laugh t'other side your mouths said the trader laying about their heads with his riding whip both ducked and ran shouting up the bank and were on their horses before he was up good evening master said sam with much gravity i bury much speck missus be anxious bout jerry master haley won't want us no longer missus wouldn't hear of our ridin to critters over lizzie's bridge to-night and with a facetious poke into andy's ribs he started off followed by the latter at full speed their shouts of laughter coming faintly on the wind End of chapter seven